in my training and when I work with my clients and I, when I work with myself, where I catch myself with judgments of, is it for me? I'm a loser. It's not for me. Um, all this deprivating thoughts. And then I step back and it's like, you, you didn't put enough effort and training yet enough. And then you start comparing to others, but they already are so much better than me. Like how long did it took for them to do this or that? Uh, I, I supposed to already be better in this. And then I caught myself, you have to respect your body. <laughs> <laughs> like it's going to take as long as it takes for your body to adjust. Like body, I mean, mental and emotional place. So always managing those expectations or assumptions with uh, knowing a little bit better of you, your learning path, and respecting that. <laughs>
to train uh, people. And uh, for the javelin, you always need a bit more mature athlete because it's super technical event. Um, so he was looking already uh, at the 16 or 14, 15 age people and athletic preferable. Um, so he heard a little bit through the schools about some tests, what I'd done for just regular and he, um, but my mom really didn't want, didn't want me to be a heavy lifter. So she said like, no, no, stick to the, your dancing and volleyball. I really want you to remain a girl. <laughs> Uh, but my coach was so persistent. So when the first snow showed up um, in the, as a weather, uh, he just arrived next to my house with Javon and says, he said, like, you just going to try it now. <laughs> Finally here. And when I tried, when uh, he brought it to my house, he, he said, you're going to be a javelin thrower and I'm going to make sure you go to the training. I will bring you from the training, but you will be training for javelin from now on. Because he, he, he saw what he really needed uh, to be a javelin thrower. And in a year and a half, uh, I became uh, really good. Uh, I broke Lithuanian records. I became finalist in the European Championships. And this is when I got recruited to study at USC um, and moved to California as a kind of javelin thrower. <laughs> and so you said it only took a year and a half um, before you're reaching that level. What were the days looking like in the early part of that? Uh, yes, my coach was really good. Um, he was almost like my shadow and he knew how to transform my body and I was really fascinated in the first time actually find out how quickly we can change ourselves, even our shape. Like uh, I would look in the mirror and I see myself like really big and suddenly really small and suddenly being able to jump and run really fast and suddenly I can lift really heavy. Like it was so fascinating to me and um, he even created plans for me when I will have ups, when I will have downs, uh, what kind of testing I should do. So going by the schedule when I would feel like I, I may be like, I'm not going to be an athlete because everything is falling and failing. Uh, but he said like, look, by the graph, you're supposed to be down right now. So it, it really taught me the process of development and learning, but it's never ever steady up. So you could manage your mental um, confidence and then the, um, patience with the development and learning uh, and he was really good at um, uh, training me and teaching me about all this development um, but he was so generous that even though he is uh, uh, even wage salary was depending on athletes and their performance and I was one of the best athletes at the time um, he said go to us because i really think you're gonna learn even more than i can give you and even like could taught me and when i arrived to us i met another coach dan lang <laughs> and he had completely different training style um and this is the picture I sent you. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what it was like to, you know, you started the conversation today telling us like what this transition must have been like for you, but tell us a little bit more. You, you arrive in the U.S. at this school. What happens? Like an alien. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling on different planet. And um, I kind of thought I'm going to keep continue training with the um, system what really worked for me and what was really successful to me um, but this kind of coach what you see in the picture it's Dan Lang one of the most famous throwers coach in US he has everybody uh, all throws becoming Olympians world champions record holders um, he is incredible coach but when I arrived because of his completely different training style what I was used to to in Lithuania, I did not trust him, even though he had uh, all these big titles, big names. I thought I knew better. <laughs> <laughs> Only a year and a half training in <laughs> javelin. Um, 
and then the, I did not trust his system, and but we agreed what uh, we're gonna um, partner and we're gonna train the way I want to. So he supposed to supervise my training. Um, but I came, because how different the trainings were that in Lithuania, my coach would tell me what to do. And then I would decide if I want to do or not. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for, like if it's scary or not, like we would fight a little bit, but he would still make me to do those things. And uh, I was just really good at, at uh, doing that I saw the progression. But when I arrived to USC and then asked me, how do you feel? And I thought like, okay, fine. Like everybody else answers. Uh, so tell me what to do or how you feel <laughs> I, uh, I should be doing javelin or training today. And so like, no, 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 no. How do you feel? Who cares? Just <laughs> tell me what to do. <laughs> I was like, no, no. How do you feel? And it's like, I don't like this kind of training. It's BS. Like, I don't want to take responsibility answering this question. What kind of stupid question? It's the first time in my life somebody asked me. <laughs> I don't even know how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> and by this kind of my answer, he will create my training. It's crazy. Like, no, no, no. I, I cannot take this kind of responsibility for designing how, what it should be next for me, especially in the field where all my career, all my passions, all my desires and successes are based on like how good a javelin thrower will be. And me looking back is fascinating. Like in sports, like you become so good at change and experimenting and doing new things every single day you're pushing yourself to do something new to perform and get better but in certain areas like this one i got completely stuck so even though i'm good at change but when i really invested and care about something as completely changing the perspective and training style I completely freaked out. Uh, so uh, I did not train by his system for three years until, unfortunately, my first coach passed. Um, I tried to look for new coaches in Europe, a similar style, but I could not find. And logistically, it wouldn't be too complicated to train. I thought I'm going to train myself because now after five years or four years of training, I am definitely expert at what I do. And I thought maybe my coaches didn't really knew my capabilities, uh, so I will push myself. And what happened is I overtrained twice. I don't know if you ever felt when you overtrain what happens. For me, it was awful. I could not even stand up from my bed because all my muscles and everything got completely uh, paralyzed. Like mm -hmm. whole season all this hard work what I did for javelin it was just waste like literally I had no motivation anymore my uh, body completely rejected me <laughs> mm -hmm. unfortunately so I had no choice anymore and I kind of tried to with coach Dan negotiate like can we train still with my style and maybe merge some with your style and he's like no, no, no first you have to answer how do you feel and we're gonna go through there and then when I was in complete corner and I really still wanted to continue throwing javelin, they're like, fine, I will try your style. And then I started, had to start to learning about feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so in this picture, we were fighting, actually. <laughs> what, why did you choose that picture? What does that moment represent? It just represents to me, uh, first of all, uh, how lucky I was to have these am amazing coaches because I never ever dreamt about going to Olympics or performing at a higher level at anything. My life trajectory was based on my surroundings and my family, which was you get the good grades, you get to university, and then you get a good job. 
and that's it. Like, that's the highlight of your life, what it should be. Like, that's it. And this is the trajectory I was going. And then all these art classes or sports, it was just a hobby to, to spend time with, but nothing ever serious. Um, and this is the man with mustache, my first coach, Antanas Telesius. He said, like, we're training for Olympics. And I had no idea what it meant, but <laughs> he had those dreams for me. And he showed me how much more I can have from life. And then Coach Dan Lang, he showed me how first I was fascinated how my body can change. Coach Dan Lang showed me how my character can change. Mm. Because when I would come in at USC, like European uh, non-smiling person (laughs) (laughs) with attitude, I would say like, this is who I am. This is the way it is. This is how I like that's it you take it or leave it you don't like it you go away you like it to stay and and that was my mindset and my coach then Lang said like no you you can you have to develop your character and then this is how you do it uh, through through really taking responsibility for your actions for your feelings for your thoughts so we're still in touch with coach Dan Lang and uh, it's like we never separated. We still continue the same conversation about development, about uh, discoveries, about the deeper uh, developmental techniques, what he is doing with his uh, athletes and clients and me. So it's amazing collaborative uh, journey, which started really rough. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it definitely uh, got uh, really meaningful. And how do you end up getting to the Olympics? Uh, yes, so uh, uh, I was quite good in college. I won nationals. I was uh, um, ranked number one all the time in the U.S. Um, and I really thought I did not exhaust all my abilities yet. Um, and after college, I needed to decide if I'm going to continue train or going to pursue my business career um and it was a bit complicated and not many choices i had because if for me to stay in u.s i had to have some kind of different visa not a student visa anymore mm-hmm. um but also i i was i was interested in um, work environment in business environment and uh, me one day making a tiny slice on my finger through chopping vegetables and I could not train for a week completely freaked me out like even like tiny cut can um, damage my career (laughs) Uh, in sports this is uh, it was it became as a thought really scared to invest all my time um, and the efforts into one path so I thought I'm going to try for one year to work full time and train full time and see how it's going to go. It really taught me well time management skills. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, and then this is how I continue train uh, while working as a senior business analyst for a medical company. And this is when I actually started also seeing the different mentalities what beca- like business professionals have and athletes have because I got really complicated uh, um, project in the company for performance and uh, I had to implement it uh, with uh, bringing lots of changes in the company. And uh, they, like, it was Friday when I met the director whom, uh, with whom we're supposed to implement those changes on Monday. So we were going through the final steps um and uh, she said like well you did really good job of uh, bringing this to our attention analyzing and creating the plan how to improve everything but we're not gonna do it (laughs) and i almost fell from the chair um but we have huge problem and you guys all agreed it is a detrimental problem to fix and this is where it really stuck with me how different again the mentalities are where even it took me three years to change all my training, but I always been testing 
if I'm right with it or open to it. But here, the safety at the workspace, um, the control of what you do is so much more important. So I was uh, still needed to make those changes in the company. So I really needed to understand how to transfer that athlete's mentality into their working workspace so I could do my job. And if this is where, uh, on another level, I started also to look at the sports psychology and performance psychology. And for my uh, journey going to Olympics, I qualified in really complicated way. Uh, it was only one throw if I'm going to go to Olympics or not. I literally oh, wow. had to duel. Um, and uh, another girl supposed to go instead of me. And I beat her. And um, uh, I was the last person to got on the Lithuanian national team to go to Olympic Games. So I had to take... Uh, uh, unpaid vacation from my work to go to Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that was my journey. But at the Olympics, um, I had always the thought that because I am working full time, I am not ready for Olympics. Like, even though physically, mentally, like I was so ready, like all my test results and technique, how I felt was at the highest level I ever experienced in my whole athletic journey. But that thought that everybody's preparing perfectly for Olympics, like all my German counterparts, I know like they have huge team going to their camps. They have like nutritionists, masseuses, like everybody's taking care of this. Like no way I can compete with them. Like, yes, I'm good for me, for my level, for my training. But it's completely another level. And uh, when I arrived to Olympics, I knew this thought gonna kill me. And it was warm ups, and I never ever felt so such a good throws. They were so easy. They were just like it's the best. It was the best feeling ever when you feel like everything just comes together so naturally and so easily. Mm -hmm. And one of the coaches from Belarus is like. Take it easy, it's just warm ups. It's not the uh, Olympics, yes. <laughs> like, save yourself. And I smiled. But I knew the minute I will step into the arena, um, it's going to be different for me. Like, it doesn't matter anymore how far I throw. Um, and even I'm battling with this thought of of like it doesn't matter how I fire throw I will throw my PR everybody else will will throw more um, so I'm trying like still do the same throws I did in uh, warm ups but I already like feeling so much pressure in me and then my friend from Belarus the coach like we were friends um, after first throw her arm popped from her shoulder socket and she runs to me she's like Inga help because she doesn't speak English so now I have like moral dilemma <laughs> oh, no. I'm already like in complicated journey with myself trying like battle my crazy thought of, of not performing well and now I have like should I help her <laughs> in the middle of Olympics right before me going pro so that was the uh, interest. <laughs> what did you do? Challenges. <laughs> did you end up helping um, her? Yeah, so what I did, I thought, uh, ah, anyhow, like, my throws suck. <laughs> 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 so I just, like, brought her to a Chinese person and said, like, in English, like, she needs help, she needs emergency, please take care of her. And then I thought, like, okay, maybe I have, like, a little bit time of prepare for my throws but it was just okay and, but uh, the completely uh, turning point for me was after competition when we uh, went to elevator uh, with all the girls who were performing in uh, qualification and then we started talking how did this experience go for all of us and um one thrower from us she said like i was throwing with my ligament store and another lady says, I have huge pain in my back. Like, and I'm thinking, I am healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I am way much more stronger and healthy than those girls. And I thought they are way much better prepared than me. Um, and at this point, it really stuck to me how our thoughts and mind really uh, stand in our way of what we do, how we live, what we experience. So uh, this has got me super fascinated in this field of thoughts. <laughs> was uh, all from starting in college when you were asked to think about your feelings, right? Um, yeah. I, was had this, the, um, yeah. Was this the first time you had felt this, what sounds like a, a lack of confidence? I was quite confident person. Even at the Olympics, I was confident with myself. I was, it was more like uh, not letting me do things to the fullest or to be relaxed. I don't know how to call it because me as a person I felt okay me as an athlete I thought I I know how to throw <laughs> uh, but all my thoughts at that time was concentrated or like my reality was that everybody else is better like I'm good and I can break world records for sure like it's no problem but doesn't matter. Here matters who is better at the time. Because of the preparation Amongst you mentioned. All of us. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's all by rankings now, not mm -hmm. on the results anymore. So because I brought that kind of reality to the place, it a bit um, created this whole hopelessness situation, even though like a con conflict. Like, I know how to throw, I'm super strong, but it doesn't matter. So what did a typical training day look like for you while you were doing the preparation for the Olympics? <laughs> My typical day would be, um, it depends uh, through the week when I would ho have throwing sessions because those would go uh, during lunchtime my lunch break when I would uh, drive to college to do the throws with my coach so he would supervise me and my own trainings for weightlifting for the sprints for the all different stuff where coach is not necessary to be so I would train or in 5 a.m before work or after work which was super complicated um, yeah to arrive in the gym at 9 p.m and have like huge racks of weights waiting for you and I'm just sitting there <laughs> and uh, just looking at the wall <laughs> thinking when I'm gonna go and finally lift it <laughs> uh, so that was would be from Monday to Friday Saturday would be a full day of uh, off so social life like normal life and then uh, Sunday would be a whole day of training so it sounds like there was uh, even then that feeling that you were not getting as much preparation time as you would like as far as the other obligations. I mean, I, in, to, be, to be honest, for me, all this training, it was perfect because even I would ask my coach, what if, if I would dedicate fully myself to one thing like mm -hmm. athletics? how good I could be like so much better. Right. And he said like, no, it, it wouldn't be Inga. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, he already realized by all my interests, what I always needed to have multiple directions for me, myself. And then when he said that I felt that, but with his confirmation, I was settled that, okay, this is, who I am and I should accept it and enjoy it with all what it gets. <laughs> I was going to say, and then you, you get to, it was the 08 Olympics, right? And in, yes. in Beijing. Yeah. So, uh, what, after that experience, did you kind of know, all right, I'm going to kind of move on with life. Like tell us a little bit about that transition. I, I know you and I have talked quite a bit about transition. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I, at that point, uh, I was already tired of this kind of lifestyle <laughs> because uh, when I decided to have this kind of lifestyle, I thought I'm going to just try for a year, mm -hmm. but it lasted for four years. 
literally this week, what I described to you, it was four years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I thought, uh, I don't think so. I can get, uh, if I would get better, it's not going to be uh, like crazy. Like it's not going to completely change my life or give me my, much more benefits. So the transition after, actually, I was thinking and dedicate a little bit more for, for training, but life circumstances, how I manage my work and living situation changed a little bit. And because with that change, uh, I thought, okay, uh, I'm done with sports. I'm just gonna think a little bit more what's, what is another part besides me being in this business, in this uh, um, work, what else I wanna experience in life. So I decided to move back to Europe and get my master's degree in Monaco and start my own business. So it was, uh, I, I, I really felt like I'm stuck right now at that moment where at the workplace I uh, achieved all what it was possible to move even up at mm -hmm. the workplace and I already spent around uh, five years in in there and it was incredible uh, experience and I really really love all of uh, the co-workers and uh, and um, I didn't know what to do next <laughs> Uh, so I really wanted to figure out uh, for my life. Uh, my mom told me when I called her from work crying, like, I um, <laughs> have no idea what to do, but everything, it feels awful. Um, she said that to write a letter to myself. <laughs> Smart mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, she's amazing. Um, uh, and then with like uh, all the tears dripping, <laughs> all the computers open with all my spreadsheets and I'm writing what I want from life and why everything is awful right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was rereading, I, I, uh, I, uh, I understood what I miss European lifestyle. I, 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 I am ready to start something new. Um, and I, this is how I flashed out where I want to focus a little bit more my attention or learning and that was more about um, behavior psychology for in the workplace mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is where I studied uh, uh, international business and global affairs so lots of politics in the business <laughs> <laughs> um, because I experienced some in my working places which I never studied at USC and I thought I was so not prepared of all this uh, uh, company politics, but you really need to know when you try to do any changes or bringing up any ideas. Um, so that was uh, interesting um, to, to go through the academic process. And I also really wanted to experience European academic process too. So it was natural transition, however, uh, the, the first kind of craziness of that transition surfaced when uh, I was at a networking place and uh, I was so used to introduce myself, oh, I'm a professional athlete. And suddenly I don't know how to introduce myself. Mm. And that was a bit uh, uh, confusing for me who I am now. <laughs> sure. And how do other people introduce themselves who are not athletes? <laughs> I mean, I think once you're an Olympian, always an Olympian, right? But <laughs> yeah. So when you ask how I should introduce, or how you should introduce me today, uh, I, I smiled remembering that story. <laughs> nice. um, and so what happens next? Are you taking that mentality of your Olympic training and putting it in the business at this point? Yes, um, I've, I've been uh, doing it uh, since uh, 2011 as an executive coach. Um, I had the mental training programs, what we created uh, with business partner, which I left a year ago, and then I joined Valor Performance, where I met Lauren, and <laughs> I really, really love that experience. 
um, and I have my own clients. Uh, I really mostly specialize with uh, startup founders and uh, also in sports technology uh, business. I'm really fascinated with technology developments and uh, I have my uh, athletes who keep me on my toes with <laughs> mastering arts. <laughs> So what are some sorry kevin what are oh, so what are some of the think about what i'm trying to ask here um what are some of the ways that you find now as a, a business person and, and coach that are maybe similar versus different to how you approached being an athlete um and that even how how i was how i was as an athlete it, it's still developing because now, when I threw myself into the new sport, which is completely different from what I used to, where I felt so confident and uh, in charge into the horseback riding, where <laughs> you're not alone anymore, you actually... And you're not really in charge at all. <laughs> <laughs> you realize that really quickly. The horse has all the power. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what I bring even to the horseback riding is um, the process of learning what uh, really taught me in my training and when I work with my clients and I, when I work with myself where I catch myself with judgments of is it for me I'm a loser it's not for me um, all this deprivating thoughts and then I step back and it's like you you didn't put enough effort and training yet enough and then you start comparing to others, but they already are so much better than me. Like, how long did it took for them to do this or that? Uh, I, I supposed to already be better in this. And then I caught myself, you have to respect your body. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's going to take as long as it takes for your body to adjust. Like, body, I mean, mental and emotional place. So always managing those expectations, those assumptions with uh, knowing a little bit better of you, your learning path, and respecting that, <laughs> respecting that speed, uh, respecting that amazingness of our ability to learn new, to transform ourselves, our bodies, our minds, and our emotions, and keep always uh, flexible in all those areas is 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 fascinating and this is where at least um, when I work with my uh, clients too uh, we tried to learn that uh, that respect to ourselves um, and especially with development uh, in any subject what we're trying to develop uh, that path <laughs> If it makes sense. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like you had such a steep learning curve early on. Does it still feel, and then, you know, this, uh, this, what sounds like very pivotal Olympic experience, does it feel foreign to kind of be trying to approach it in that way with like patience and that growth mindset? Um, because of all those ex ex long experiences, especially when I needed to change my training styles, at one point uh, I thought, this is it. This is what kind of thrower I am. I'm only throwing 55 meters and that's it. Like I'm never going to improve because statistically for two or three years, I was throwing only that. Only that for three years. Mm -hmm. And after one competition, I thought, coach, like, that's it. Even though I had longer, like, bigger PR, but statistically, my consistency was only on that. Um, and after we continued the training, I improved it by a lot. <laughs> Still. But uh, and, and that showed me... But even three years of, of being with the same result doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> and was that, was your advancement after that, your improvement, was that, would you attribute that more to a physical change or more to a mental change or some combination? Absolutely mental. Uh, because not, especially my last year in college, 
I was so busy trying to get the job or figure out how I'm going to stay in the U.S. after um, my eligibility ends. Um, and uh, I studied entrepreneurship. I was training full time. So I did not have any more time to make assumptions or expectations for myself. But um, pressured me before because before I would go into the competition and I would think this is it now I will PR because I feel so good and I would throw again the same result as I always do um, and I thought like physically or like even with confidence level it felt like I'm I'm that's all I can do like I'm good but uh, it really showed me when I just started enjoying process of throwing, of performing without expectations because I had no time anymore <laughs> uh, for, for, for anything else. Then uh, I finally relaxed and let it be. Um, and, and this is when the, all the marks started to, to come. And, and because even when I ask my clients or even high performance athletes, like what is high performance? It's such a big notion that you have to give all of it. This is the high performance. No. In practice, you give all of it. But in competition, you have to let it go. <laughs> let it be. Uh, be um, just be relaxed with that uh, um, enjoy, enjoyment of, of uh, technique and get, getting all that energy freely flowing through you. Uh, and that's really hard to, to, to accomplish, but when you have a vision or understanding what is high performance, then um, at least you know to what, for what you're preparing to. <laughs> So was that, looking back on your Olympics experience, do you feel like you had that mindset in the warm-up when you were throwing really, yes. quote-unquote, well, but when it competition time, you couldn't find that place? Absolutely. Uh, it's exactly how you said. I still remember, like, bird's nest in front of me. We are outside the stadium for warm-up area. Sun is rising because it was early morning and all this atmosphere i just never been so happy to be there amongst the best athletes in the world ever <laughs> uh, at that moment and I, I was part of it and i i was owning it and it was amazing feeling um to experience and uh, how i qualified for that spot uh, on Olympic team, it really solidified because I only had one throw to make it or not uh, to Olympics. And when I was going into that throw, I was thinking, I shouldn't be nervous right now. Like, I am literally with Javelin going on a runway, and I know, but this is it. Like, if I'm not gonna throw B standard for Olympics, I'm not going to Olympics ever. Like, it's no way what in four years I will prepare again for Olympics. And previous two times, I, even though I qualified, uh, it was re different reasons why I didn't go. So this is it. And I, I was not nervous. And I was, and I already knew what I, it, I will be fine. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I will be fine. And I threw, and it was like really good mark. Um, after that, I had huge headache <laughs> because I was in some kind of dimension <laughs> where I could talk to myself even about like nerves, <laughs> but it did not, did not affect me. And then um, I, I was so fascinated about this experience. And I realized for the first time in my life, even though in many competitions I had a flow um, sensation, but I never had this in this kind of situation where it's like die or live <laughs> now or never um, when I felt what I don't need 
to be anywhere else and to be anybody else. Like I am there, I'm in my place with my mental, emotional, physical, technical, all of it. I am there. So being one with all those different parts, because many times we think whatever we do is like, maybe I should be doing something else or maybe I should be somewhere else someone else <laughs> <laughs> and then at that moment for the first time in my life I I I, I thought like this is where I have to be and then it fascinated me and how soon into that throw did you realize that it was going to go well for you was it immediately did it have to land it's before mm. even uh, um, like in athletics especially it's easy to see when even in the sprints, everybody line up, you know exactly who's going to perform well and who's not going to perform right before. All the coaches know, just looking at the athlete's eyes, mm-hmm. where they're looking and how they're settled. Or, like literally, you can tell instantly and you're never going to be wrong. So what have you learned about yourself through this journey? <laughs> Do you have time for a whole book? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is such a complicated question. Um, I think so, like, what I learned about myself is is uh, I love challenges. <laughs> I always get myself into the crazy experiences or life gets me in a crazy experience, but I know I have a strength to go over it. And that strength comes not only from the experience that I had, but also from the support. Um, and, uh, I took quite intentional time to rebuild my support system because I traveled so much. I would have really amazing friends, but anytime I would move to another country, I had to rebuild all my friendships Mm -hmm. because it's impossible to continue long distance. So I never had the family. I never had the best friends structure, um, and then and, uh, for the past uh, few years, I rebuilt my relationship with my family, with my friends, and uh, new challenges would come in uh, recently, really hard ones. Uh, it really paid off. <laughs> it, it, and it really um, made me reevaluate how, how, how important it is. And when you have this stability where you know how to how to dissociate, um, how to, how um, you are made of, (laughs) Mm -hmm. like thoughts and emotions is not exactly who you are, it's just experiences what always come up, but you have a ability to look at them from the side and and decide where you're going to put your attention in, so that really helps in figuring yourself out and not being as reactive to everything that happens, or at least if you're reactive later on, not to make yourself damaged from the experience as such and really build that life of more quality and more uh, understanding um, how to shape it the way uh, uh, you want to, or at least to experience it. And then how uh, the community of support is uh, important. So this is what I learned. What no challenge, no matter what challenges or whatever happens to you, if if you you keep developing this deep relationship with yourself and others, then you should be okay. <laughs> <laughs> you had mentioned at one point you were ranked number one, um, and at that point, did you could you recognize that you were different or better than I don't. Better than others sounds wrong, I guess. But did you recognize you were different from your peers as far as your accomplishments at that point? I've been cocky, yes. (laughs) Yes, you know. (laughs) And my teammates really made the intervention. Mm. (laughs) Literally. Um, When I arrived to the U.S., when uh, I still... I already started understanding English, but not completely yet. And then... Mm -hmm. uh, my teammates organized the little 
get together on one of the weekends and when I'm there I was sitting and I was like oh all this meeting is about me <laughs> how they don't like how I behave how I like come into the training with bad mood and influence everybody and how I treat coach and so on so that and I just like who the hell are you like I am here number one <laughs> I mean, in my thoughts, this is yeah. what I was thinking, like defending myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, later on, uh, I really quickly understood, because it was really conflicting for me, me coming from Lithuania, where smiling is not appropriate, because mm. the, it's like, it seems like it's something wrong with you, <laughs> if you always like enjoying your life <laughs> and in us like no matter how awful everything is like why are you not smiling it's like mm. why I would smile i haven't slept for a few days and i like had huge exams and like i don't know with my training what's going on like what is the reason here to smile i'm like so tired so i almost snapped when some person told me smile <laughs> <laughs> So it was like lots of conflicting for me cultures uh, to figure out. But in the end, I really understood how much we influence each other. And um, somewhere in the middle way, we are honest with our feelings to ourselves and others, but also knowing how to support each other, uh, giving that energy to each other, which is not uh, uh, depleting of each other. It's super important. So um, I got the message. <laughs> <laughs> Through getting that message and that evolution, were you able to, I'm assuming you were, you were able to hold on to your confidence, but it, did it take on a different feel or kind of lens of having that confidence? Uh, it's a good question. I would say, um, you know, like whenever we learn something, it's not what we unlearn something else, we add on it. Mm. So I think... Um, to the confidence what I had in my field, it add another dimension of, okay, another dimension of how I can even get more energy for whatever I'm doing by being supportive to others. It's like in a high level competition between athletes, it's not uh, animosity. Mm -hmm. Like you cheer for each other because you know whoever is breaking the record, it's so much easier for you gonna be to repeat that performance because of the mentality of, of that like somebody's done it so it means like you can do it too mm. um and then you know what if you will receive the same support you will be able to lead again uh, with maybe some new developments in technique or, or something else so um at the high level, it's definitely uh, mostly it's support of each other. I really love pole vaulters. Like if you see any of the competition, they give each other poles even they break. Like uh, super supportive between each other. So, what advice would you give an aspiring uh, athlete? Um, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> um. But what uh, I do with athletes right in the beginning when we start working is asking why they're in the sport, what inspires them, and um, how would they see their own training or their own person as an athlete if they would be an artist? How they would develop those techniques, those performances, when they would be creative um, and uh, becoming masters of the art mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and through that lens and then how much actually sports can give to the society. I really love the, uh, one of the lectures of what I heard from the Stanford University about uh, Olympics and what is the meaning of it, of high performance. It's, uh, I, I really love that perspective, what it is coming closer to God's high performance in one way, because you as a human, you're, um, you die and everybody forgets about you, but God's, they live forever. Mm 
-hmm. So with high performance, with breaking records, where you're becoming a legend or creating legacy, you will live forever like gods. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're closer to death. <laughs> <laughs> coming to that high performance it's like fine uh, fine uh, balance uh, what you really need to understand so uh, I, uh, I really love that analogy what i heard from them <laughs> yeah that's amazing and then uh, how that can be inspiring for other people who watch sports mm -hmm. and athletes performs like what's possible what it can get inspired them to do uh, their best performance in their fields or it would be sales or accounting or uh, psychologists <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost uh if you unlock your mind so to speak you can actually create a better picture of you or your field it sounds like yeah i think so when we incorporate when we incorporate most all our senses, imagination, and we uh, have courage of inventing or creating something new, what's not been done before, not only um, imitating, by imitating, but also being something, doing something differently with the pure purpose of, of that uh, notion, what is the most important here. Um, then you have that uh, flexibility of possibilities. Mm. Oh, I got super poetic here. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that was beautifully said. <laughs> um, Lauren, do you want to pose the um, question on uh, Yeah. Percentage? So Kevin and I originally met uh, back in grad school when we were working on expert performance research under you know, uh, the direction of Anders Ericsson, uh, David Eccles, Paul Ward. Um, and so we've been posing to our guests uh, this question uh, that basically kind of puts it in their corner to think about this notion of nature versus nurture and how do we become experts. And obviously on the extreme, there's extreme ends of the continuum. It's all, you know, you're born with it talent kind of notion, mm -hmm. or it's all what you do with it and what resources you have. So if you had to give each a percentage uh, out of a hundred, obviously, what would you, what would you, what's your answer for that? Mm, I think so, like, finding, first of all, uh, your nature, <laughs> it's a big question, sure. uh, because I never would find my javelin if some person wouldn't land in my math class <laughs> by complete accident. Um, and then, and, uh, I mean, uh, so I would say uh, 90 to 10. 10% Which... uh, would be uh, uh, nature and 90% nurture. And you're kind of saying that 10% has to come first and then you pursue the 90%? Uh, I mean, uh, I studied this uh, field uh, quite a bit where I was at one time on the path where we all created equally and uh, uh, so we all have uh, the same chance of succeeding but unfortunately through the studies what i made uh, it made me realize what not we are genetically different in many different ways mm -hmm. and um, some people can be physically more advanced some mentally more advanced with uh, um, through the genetics um, so uh, it comes first, in my opinion, the nature. Yeah. Um, anything that we haven't asked you that you feel is important to share? Um, <laughs> you guys, I just don't uh, used to anymore to speak about myself so much because <laughs> lately I have so many clients, so always <laughs> in the question position. Um, what I would like to share is, uh, I know just uh, from my uh, last experiences, uh, um, the, the, the latest discovery what I found is what time does not exist. <laughs> Actually, so, right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like with my first 
personal uh, experience and health and with COVID when we had so many plans and uh, goals what we set up with deadlines and everything got got mixed up um, everything had to become rescheduled with unknown so uh, it, it really gave me freedom of where I don't have any more concept of time expectations or or assumptions <laughs> mm -hmm. I know exactly that it doesn't mean that I don't do anything and I just let life happen I know exactly the directions what I want to go to however I don't have any expectations or deadlines when it's gonna happen mm -hmm. like I completely those experiences uh, completely erased that notion for me and uh, it really lifted lots of pressure from me and what would you say is the biggest takeaway from your story? I should ask you guys about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, my takeaway, at least uh, through, through my outlook to, to myself, what I like to consider is uh, um, experiencing life and then build, finding what is quality for you. I think so that's meaningful uh, for us to figure out. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Inga. It's been awesome to um, listen to your story in, in more depth than I even knew it before um, and to have you share it with our listeners today. So we really appreciate you coming on the show and talking to us. Thank you so much for having me. The Path to Tilt is hosted by Kevin Harris and Lauren Tashman, created and produced by Kevin Harris. The content is copyrighted by The Path to Stilled, all rights reserved. <laughs>